Hello and welcome to the show. You're watching Tech24. I'm Julia Seeger. Many futurologists say 2020 will be a year of take breakthroughs with lots of predictions about what technologies are set to become our new normal. But how many of these futuristic guesses are actually true? We'll ask our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. And in Test24, we take a look at two innovations from French startups showcased at this year's CES in Las Vegas, the headphone BASME and the box by Living Packets that are set to take France by storm. And as we enter 2020, we wanted to reflect on a tendency that's becoming more and more prevalent, especially during this time of year when the CES in Las Vegas is attracting all the attention. And that is predicting future tech trends. But how often do we go back about what didn't happen? Elon Musk, for instance, had predicted that self-driving cars would be on every street by now. And the list of what didn't happen in 2019 is actually quite long down. The list, I feel like, is endless. And when you see this, it's really hard to have faith in any predictions. Well, yes, one example, as you mentioned, was uh, the arrival of uh, fully autonomous cars on our streets in 2020. But it was going to be a difficult target to meet because of the complexities of the technologies involved in developing uh, these autonomous cars. Now, some of the examples include uh, driving in different weather conditions, like in heavy rain or snow, or anticipating unexpected movements in the surroundings. And uh, equally important was, or is rather, the car-to-car uh, -car communication. So unless these challenges are overcome, uh, I don't think we'll see fully autonomous cars on our streets. But according to one estimate, in five years' time, we will see uh, applications for driverless cars uh, when it comes to delivering packages or hauling goods on our highways. Now, another big miss, of course, was delivery drones. We thought that they'd be common by now. Well, some companies have actually uh, successfully experimented with drone deliveries like the international subsidiary of the French Postal Service, La Poste, which is called the DPD. And there's also the example of the Irish firm MANA, which says that it will start uh, food deliveries within a two kilometer radius in three minutes this year. But again, uh, the, this trend is not commonplace, more so because of the regulations involved uh, when it comes to flying drones. Thank you, Dan. And as we wait for these delivery drones to become mainstream, let's take a look at an innovation that is happening to transform the way we grocery shop. In Japan, the trolleys are now doing all the hard work for you, as Kathy Clifford reports. This surface of over 10,000 meters squared is dotted with over 1,500 cameras. They track and store customers' movements around the aisles, assessing their ages and genders. Here's the smart trolley. All our clients have a prepaid card, you scan it and put in your PIN. Then promotions are suggested according to your purchase history. Through the camera system, the amount of time customers spend hesitating between products can be analysed. This means certain areas of the supermarket can be assessed as being of more value to advertisers. This supermarket has seen a 10% rise in sales since it was equipped with its new smart system. Hikari Tokunagi comes to do her shopping once a week. I can see in real time what I'm buying and what I'm spending. Most importantly, it's very quick. You don't need to queue at the till. This is because her groceries have already been rung up automatically on her prepaid card. But it's not for everyone. It's not really my thing. I'd prefer to pay in cash. Customers aren't the only ones being filmed. These tiny cameras are not an anti-theft measure, but a means of keeping track of shelf stock. At the reins of this mass operation, just one IT worker on one computer. We used to have staff to check shelves were stocked. Now, with this system, it's the cameras that alert us instantly. It means less workers are needed. In Japan, we have a serious problem. A lack of workforce due to an aging population. And artificial intelligence allows us to get around this shortage. Three of these supermarkets are now open 24-7. Soon, advertising screens like these will react to passing customers' profiles, while prices will fluctuate in real time, giving online shopping a run for its money. And let's now take a look at what is set to become true in 2020, Dan. Well, 5G technology will witness wide-scale implementation, as many carriers have said they will do so. And with it, there will be new applications and devices and the promise of speed 
10 to 100 times faster than our current networks. Now, VR, of course, we've been talking about VR a lot, but this year it's set to become an even more important trend thanks to Facebook that's launching a new social platform. Well, yes, it's called Horizon and it will be available on the Oculus uh, VR headsets. Uh, basically, users can design their own avatars, they can create communities, they can play games, and they can interact with other users in this VR world. Thank you, Dan. Now, since the beginning of time, men have actually tried to predict the future. The ancient Mayas to Nostradamus famously made predictions about when civilization would end. And while those predictions may sound arcane, modern life still re relies heavily on prophecy. Think about weather forecast or even your GPS. Well, to speak more about the job of so-called futurologist, I'm joined by Scott Smith, the managing partner at Changiest, a company based in the Netherlands. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thanks for having me. So why is it important to imagine, if not predict, the future? That's a really good question, Julia. I think there's a, there's a number of things that go on when we, when we think about or predict the future. Um, there, you know, part of it is a, a cultural issue. It's about projecting one's own ideas about what the future might be. For some people, it's a warning, a way of alerting others to where there's risk and uncertainty. Um, and for others, it's status. It's a way of, of letting people or getting people to believe that you have information or insider knowledge that they don't. Um, most good practicing futurists don't do predictions. Um, they stick to forecasts and, and other sorts of uh, models and scenarios rather than get caught in that, uh, that kind of trap. Now, you were just talking about models. You've actually developed a very rigorous methodology to think the future. Tell us more about it. Well, in this kind of work that we do with uh, commercial organizations and governments uh, and NGOs, you, you aren't so much trying to predict a single outcome at a, at a future date uh, as um, understand what you do and don't know better. There are a number of tools that have been developed over the past 50 or 60 years within the futures or foresight field. Um, we use variations of those to collect information um, to make sure that you have a, a wide sort of spread or spectrum of inputs um, to use different techniques to, to model and map and make sense of that information. Uh, and then to turn the outcomes of that sense making into stories, into scenarios, things that you can communicate to other people, other people inside an organization or the public to help them understand how you think the future might unfold. Uh, and then you, you ask, so what? What does that mean? What does that mean in terms of impact and cost? Um, what, what should we do? What do other people do? What do our customers or our citizens do? Um, and that kind of process of thinking and basically churning through information and you know, synthesizing and making some analysis of it uh, is, a, is a pretty standard framework for getting to a clearer vision of what you do and don't know and understand where there may be different risks or opportunities. Now, briefly, uh, we're seeing the emergence of new types of prophecies. I'm thinking about collapsology, for instance. Isn't it unfair in a way to lay that stress on people, knowing that such a prediction couldn't just never happen? Well, as I said a few minutes ago, part of what's kind of Im embedded or packed into predictions or kind of worldviews like that, like collapsology, for example, or its opposite uh, effect, abundance, um, both of those are uh, in part trying to kind of uh, project a worldview or an ideology uh, to get people on board with the way that you think about how the future might unfold. Um, there's a lot of kind of negative issues embedded in things like collapsology, but that should be thought of as different, for example, than um, talking about climate change and you know having actual models and data that show that conditions may be getting worse. One is a, as a, as a forecast by which we can make better decisions. Um, the other is a way of seeing the world, kind of lens of seeing the world. Scott Smith, thank you very much indeed for that. You're welcome. Thank you. And we're going to move on now to Test 24. Like every year in January, we're going to turn and look at what's buzzing at the CES in Las Vegas. Dan, you just harnessed yourself with a gadget. It's called BassMe. How does it work? Well, it's a personal subwoofer, so it adds the bass uh, to the sound you are listening to. So, For example, I'm listening to a piece of music on my smartphone. I can already feel the difference. I can feel the vibrations uh, directly on my chest. So this is placed uh, on the chest. and. 
uh, what it does is it makes you turn down the volume because you're already having this tactile sensation. Now this subwoofer is made by the company Studio Durwa, which is based in Perpignan, and uh, mm -hmm. you can connect this subwoofer to the phone either with Bluetooth or you can have a, a wired connection as well. Now we were talking about shipping earlier. This seems like a delivery box. It's called Living Packets. Well, yes, it's called the box. It's a smart box that's equipped with many sensors. It has a camera. We that helps you to track it in real time. Uh, you can also determine the moisture content, the shock it absorbs and so on. And the interesting part is that uh, the company wants one box to be used at least 1000 times. So there is very low carbon footprint and you can deliver different types of uh, packages in this box. So for example, this is the, you can send the normal package in this and when you fold it, you can send uh, Something, something flatter. Right. Something like, smaller. Uh, yeah. Wow, that's yeah. very impressive. Like envelopes or books. Thank you very much indeed. Dan and Jay Cattle Car there. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24. But you can watch it again on our website, France24.com. See you soon.